Hello, students. Um, today we're going to be reviewing Chapter 16. Um, so you see that we're not really going in the exact order of the textbook. So we talked about the endocrine system, and then we talked about the digestive system. Chapter 16 really talks about kind of like an integration of both of these systems together. So we'll talk about metabolism and the effect of hormones on different met metabolic processes. So these are the topics that we're going to be covering. We'll cover sections A, B, and C. So first off, how do we, how does the body, whether it's the endocrine system or the nervous system, control kind of how all of these um, metabolic processes interact together, whether it's carb or proteins or fat metabolism. And then section B talks about how does our body regulate how much energy we intake, um, you know, versus our uh, caloric output. And then Section C talks about regulation of body temperature. During this lecture um, and the rest of the recording lecture, recorded lectures, I would really recommend that you do these kind of in increments. So, um, you know, 15 minutes to 20 minutes long and then pause the recording and kind of reflect and go back and make sure that you got everything um, and then kind of move on instead of doing this whole lecture in one setting. So we're going to start with the major metabolic pathways of the absorptive state. So first off, we want to understand what does what is the absorptive state and what is the post-absorptive state. So the absorptive state means that this is the state of your body when you eat a meal. So you just had a meal, whether it's carbs or proteins or fats or a combination of all three. Um, what is going on in your body? What your body wants to do is that it will use that all of these nutrients that you just ate and its main um, source of energy would be glucose. So you'll see here that your main source of energy for all of your tissue would be glucose, but anything extra. So um, all of the extra stuff that we ate, the body is going to, it has different ways to store it um, so that when we enter the post-absorptive state, which would be about, you know, th three to five hours after your last meal, um, we could kind of tap into these storage areas and use that for energy. So we'll take a look at them. And this thing, first off, let's kind of learn what all of these boxes are. Um, the boxes on top, this one kind of represents all of your tissues um, versus your muscle. This would be all of your tissue and what kind of, you know, what do we use in order to energize them or to provide ATP, that would be your glucose. And then this up here represents your adipose tissue. Okay, this big box in the middle represents the liver. And you wanna think of the liver as your kitchen. Okay, so the liver is going to be taking all of the goodies and all of the nutrients from the digestive system and use it to cook up different things. And then this box down here is your digestive system. So this is your small intestine um, after you've you know, fully digested everything. And then this is what we're going to be absorbing. And this is where we're going to really start this whole process. So we'll talk about carbs first. Okay, so remember we said that we can only absorb monomers. So we'll absorb glucose, galactose, and fructose. Um, we're going to be talking kind of mostly about glucose um, in this chapter. And as, we, as I said, that everything has to go first through the um, portal hepatic portal circulation. Everything goes to the liver first. So your glucose reaches the liver. Okay, the glucose can do a couple of things. Sorry, the liver can do a couple of things with glucose. It'll burn it to get energy, just like any other cell. Okay, and then the hepatocytes can also store any extra glucose as glycogen. Okay, and that process is known as glycogenesis. It can also change glucose into um, fatty acids and glycerol. So if you guys remember that triglycerides is made out of one glycerol molecule and three fatty acid chains. So what the liver could do is change that glucose into a glycerol and or fatty acid chains and then combine these two together to make a molecule of triglyceride. And then that triglyceride will either be stored in the liver, okay, leading to a fatty liver, um, or it could be stored in the adipocytes, which would be your basically the fat cells. Okay, so that is, you know, kind of like the process of what is going to happen to glucose. As for the triglycerides that we ate, 
Okay, those are transported in the circulation as chylomicrons. Um, okay, those are going to be transported to your adipose cells and stored as triglycerides. Um, any protein that we ate up as we talked in chapter 15 is going to be digested into amino acids. Those amino acids are going to be transported to the tissue where the body could use those amino acids to build up its own protein. So maybe make um, muscle protein or proteins, you know, bone protein, skin protein, whatever tissue it is. While other amino acids can also go to the liver and the liver can use that to make what are known as keto acids. Keto acids can be used, um, can be burned to provide energy as well. Okay, or keto acids can be converted into fatty acids and help in making even more triglycerides. In the process of making keto acids, um, one of the byproducts is ammonia or NH3, and then a metabolite of ammonia would be urea, and that is kind of excreted through the renal system. Okay, so you can see basically out of all of this mess of a slide, um, a couple of things to kind of take away from this. First off, in your absorptive state, your main source of energy is going to be glucose. Okay, and then anything extra is going to be stored um, kind of like in stages. So stage one would be to complete your storages of glycogen. Okay, so store glucose in the liver by um, making glycogen, which is, we called glycogenesis. Also in your skeletal muscles, glucose is going to be stored as glycogen. And then when we are done storing, you know, when all of these glycogen stores, stores are full, the body will store anything extra as triglyceride, whether in the adipose tissue um, or in other organs, like in the liver, for example. Okay. Um, all, this, all of this is under the effect of insulin. So a couple of... Um, slides down, we're going to be talking about what is the action of insulin and how does insulin affect our body um, in the absorptive state. Instead of having to kind of, you know, memorize that list, you could easily use what we just talked about. So insulin is going to increase your glucose uptake by all of your tissue. It is going to increase the process of glycogenolysis. It is going to um, increase the process of making fatty acids, and it's also going to increase the process of protein synthesis. The process of making fat, sorry, of making triglycerides is known as lipogenesis. Okay, so again, this whole absorptive state is under the influence of insulin, high levels of insulin that um, after you eat, and low levels of glucagon. Now, so summary of this absorptive state, like I said, that in order to get energy, the main source of energy in the cells um, after a meal, it would be your, would be glucose. Any excess carb or any excess glucose, glucose is going to be stored as glycogen, whether in your liver or in your muscle. Um, while the anything else, you know, when you're done storing, getting all of your glycogen storage, Extra glucose that you have is going to be changed into fatty acids and glycerol and then made into a triglyceride molecule and stored in the adipose tissue. Um, for the amino acids, we're going to use those to build protein. And again, these functions are under the effect of insulin. So what about cholesterol? So we kind of talked, you know, generally speaking about different kinds of um you know about triglycerides but cl cholesterol is an important kind of fat we usually tend to think of it as you know bad uh, but with there are certain functions we do need a little bit of cholesterol um, so we'll talk about the uses of cholesterol that if you guys remember the um, the structure of the cell membrane all of our cell membranes were made out of those bilayers of phospholipid and there were scattered cholesterol molecules that gave the cell membrane its structure. Okay, so we do need cholesterol for all of our cell membranes. Some endocrine glands actually made steroid hormones. And remember, all of our steroid hormones are basically cholesterol-based. And the liver also needs cholesterol in order to make bile. 
Okay, so there are two ways where we get cholesterol. Either the liver makes it, okay, so liver can synthesize its own cholesterol, and the enzyme um, that controls that process is HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. That is the enzyme necessary, it's a hepatic enzyme that is necessary to make cholesterol. Um, another source of cholesterol would be diet. Okay, so we either eat cholesterol or our liver makes it. If we eat lots of cholesterol, okay, so an increase of dietary cholesterol intake is going to inhibit that HMG-CoA reductase enzyme and stop the liver um, from making its own cholesterol since you're already eating it. So those are going to be your sources of cholesterol. Now, how do we kind of so that's your cholesterol input. What about your cholesterol output? Well, we could use it to make steroid hormones or um, make parts of the cell membrane. The liver is going to use that cholesterol to make bile and bile salts and um, secrete those as well. Um, anything extra, sometimes we can excrete extra cholesterol in feces. Know that some of the statin um, medications, for example, um, Lipitor, for, for instance, which is a cholesterol-lowering drug, um, acts on that enzyme. It inhibits HMG-CoA re reductase enzyme in the liver and hence stops the liver from making its own cholesterol. But it would be useless if the patient does not decrease its, their dietary cholesterol intake. Now, these are the different ways, or this is the way that we carry um, our, our triglycerides. Remember, triglycerides are hydrophobic. They are, have to be coated with protein in order to be circulated in the bloodstream. So this shows you how that occurs. All of these little tiny things in the middle, all of that are triglycerides, and they are surrounded by these phospholipids. So remember, the phospholipid had a hydrophilic head and two hydrophobic tails. The hydrophobic heads are facing the plasma, okay, separating the plasma from those triglycerides. You can also see those these um, purple proteins. These are known as apolipoproteins, um, and all of so that protein and these phospholipid um, heads, those make this huge molecule soluble in water. Okay, now we're we're able to transport these triglycerides in the bloodstream. And there are different kinds, we call these um, lipoproteins. So it's made out of lipid and proteins together. We've got different kinds of lipoproteins. These are the four major ones that we want to know. We have chylomicrons. They are, they've got VLDL, which stands for very low density lipoprotein. And then there's LDL that stands for low density lipoprotein. And HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. So LDL, VLDL, and chylomicrons are your bad kind of lipids. HDL tends to be the only good cholesterol one, or the go only good fat. So we'll talk about, you know, where did these names come from? Well, chylomicron, um, and these, we'll talk about these numbers as well. So these numbers represent the ratio of fat to protein. So if you look at the chylomicron, for instance, these molecules are huge. They have lots of fat, um, much more fat than there is protein on the outside. So relatively, and the ratio is 99 to 1, meaning for every triglyc 99 molecules of triglyceride on the inside, there is just one molecule of protein on the outside. So that scale, that 99 ratio, means that there is much more triglycerides than there is, much more fat than there is protein. Um, and this is the chylomicrons that we talked about during when we were discussing the digestive system. Um, VLDL, that ratio tends to be lower. The ratio is 9, so we're getting better. Um, LDL, still considered bad cholesterol. The ratio is 3.5, so for every 3.5 molecules of triglyceride on the inside, there is one molecule of protein on the outside. It, this is the molecule this is how the body carries cholesterol from the liver to the cells, okay, which is something that we don't want to do. We want to keep 
the cholesterol, we always want to kind of wash the cholesterol away towards the liver so the liver can get rid of it, either in bile or metabolize it into anything else. So LDL, again, is one of those bad cholesterol molecules that delivers cholesterol to your cells. Remember, some we do we still need cholesterol, but if we have too much LDL, that's not a good thing. Okay, HDL, the ratio is much better. So for every one and a half molecule of triglycerides, there is one molecule of protein. And this HDL, this is how we transport cholesterol away from the cells. So if there is an atherosclerotic plaque, plaque, for example, we can transport any cholesterol in there to the liver and the liver can use that to make bile. So this is considered our good cholesterol. So if you look at somebody's test results and you see cholesterol levels, Okay, total cholesterol levels, that is really meaningless unless you look at the breakdown. So you want to look at the ratio between um, LDL to HDL. So the LDL to HDL ratio, you want to have more HDL than LDL. So HDL is your denominator, okay, so that would make that lower ratios are healthier. Um, at this point, I would kind of recommend that you guys pause the video and kind of reflect on what we talked about before you decide to move on. Um, our next step is to talk about the post-absorptive state. So the post-absorptive state means that you have not eaten anything for three to five hours. Your body doesn't get into the state unless you had nothing to eat including snacks, okay, um, nothing to eat or drink, except for water, um, for three to five hours. Your body is now, it's kind of used up all of the glucose that you ate five hours ago, and now needs to start tapping into its storages. So the first storage it'll tap into would be glycogen. So your muscles will tap into your glycogen and use that to make, you know, to burn that glycogen, make lactic acid and pyruvic acid, um, you know, depending on aerobic or anaerobic and so on. Your liver will also tap into its own glycogen, make start make, breaking it down into glucose, and that process is known as glycogenolysis. Um, and that glucose will go through the bloodstream and be distributed to the rest of the body in order for other cells to use as well. You, when we're done with these glycogen storages, the second storage to tap into would be triglycerides. Okay, so that is kind of like the steps that we use. We first use the glucose that we ate. When we run out of glucose, three to five hours after our meal, we tap into glycogen. When glycogen is done, we start breaking down triglycerides. Okay, triglycerides can break down into glycerol and fatty acids. Glycerol is transported to the liver and can be used to make glucose. Um, the process of making glucose out of other things is known as gluconeogenesis. So this whole, um, so far we've talked about increase of glycogenolysis and the increase of gluconeogenesis. You can see here that well, what if somebody is starving and they have not eaten anything for, say, two to three days? So they tapped into their all of their glycogen storage. Glycogen storage doesn't last that long. It lasts about, you know, at the most about six to seven hours. OK, so six to seven hours later, you're going to start tapping into your adipose tissue. And then, um, you know, needing more energy, we might even reach a point where we will start to break down our own protein, start to breaking down our um, muscle mass. So you'll see here we could also do that and use those amino acids, amino acids transported to the liver, and we can also make glucose out of it, another way of gluconeogenesis. So again, you again you want to always think of the liver as that kitchen that can take different ingredients and cook up different things. Okay, so, so far we kind of talked about how the post-absorptive state occurs hours after your meal, at least three to five hours, nothing to eat or drink except for water, no snacking. Okay, so a lot of us don't even reach this post-absorptive state because we snack a lot. Um, 
But let's say we, we didn't. Okay, due to the lack of glucose, that is going to stimulate your pancreas to make glucagon, your um, alpha cells to make glucagon, and your beta cells are going to be inhibited from making insulin. So this post-absorptive state is under the effect of glucagon. Hence, again, when you get to that glucagon slide, um, you already know that glucagon increases or stimulates glycogenolysis. It increases the process of gluconeogenesis, and it also helps in protein catabolism. And in the breakdown of triglyceride, what is known as lipolysis. So what is the other kinds of sources of energy that we can use? Well, glucose is definitely one of them, okay? And we body usually tends to keep glucose and kind of reserve glucose for your nervous tissue, okay? Um, it'll, the rest of the body can use other things. The rest of the body could use fatty acids um, or ketones, okay? Fatty acids for um, the, our nervous tissue does not have the enzymes to break down fatty acids, so that's definitely something that the nervous tissue cannot use. Ketones, the nervous tissue can use if we run out of glucose. So let's say, you know, in areas of malnutrition, areas of starvation, where they're at a point where there is no glucose left, um, their only source of energy would be ketones, the nervous tissue is able to use it, okay? Um, and again, the body tends to do what is known as glucose sparing, where it will keep the glucose and kind of direct it towards your nervous tissue while the rest of the body is able to use fatty acids and ketones and burn those for energy. So kind of summary to kind of wrap up the post-absorptive state, again, it is under the influence of glucagon. Um, so high glucagon levels, low insulin levels. There is a total, there is a breakdown of the storages. Okay, so we'll break down glycogen, a process that we call glycogenolysis. We'll break down fat, we named that lipolysis. We are also going to start breaking down protein. Um, and um, we are going to use all of these other ingredients, the glycerol and the amino acids from these um, catabolic reactions, and make gluco new glucose in the liver. And that process is known as gluconeogenesis. Okay, and all of that newly produced glucose is going to be released into the body. The body tends to, again, kind of spare that glucose for the nervous tissue. Okay, that process is known as glucose sparing because the rest of the body can use ketones and fatty acids. If we run out of glucose, the brain can use ketones as well. Okay, but again, it cannot use fatty acids as a source of energy. Here is a comparison between the absorptive and the post-absorptive state. Um, if you're, you know, if you've, if you, if you're still printing out the slides, I would definitely recommend writing here the post of the absorptive state to put down that it is under the influence of insulin, so high insulin, low glucagon levels. In your post-absorptive state, this is high glucagon, low insulin levels. So in the absorptive state, this is an anabolic phase. You're making different things. You're storing excess glucose as glycogen. You are going to store you know, all of these excess glucose as well. You can change it into glycerol and fatty acids and store that as triglycerides. And any excess amino acids can be used in order to build protein. Your main source of energy in your cells would be glucose. And then again, um, you know, excess glucose will be stored first as glycogen, second as triglycerides. When we compare that with our post-absorptive state, this is a catabolic stage where we need to break down all of those storages. We are going to break down glycogen, releasing glucose, and we call that process glycogenolysis. We will break down triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids, and we call that lipolysis. We are also going to increase protein catabolism in order to make these amino acids. We could use these nutrients in order to transport them to the liver to make glucose, and we call that process gluconeogenesis. The main source of energy um, to, the ret to the brain is still going to be glucose, but to the rest of the body would be fatty acids and ketones. And again, we can use all of the other um, metabolites 
or the results of the other metabolism activities in order to make glucose and keep that, you know, keep that glucose supply going to the brain. Now this is a summary of the response of the high insulin versus low insulin levels. Um, and this is what you know I was kind of talking about, trying to keep in mind your absorptive state is under the effect of insulin and the post-absorptive state is under the effect of low insulin levels, um, which means you have high glucagon levels. So we'll kind of read this off together. So your plasma insulin levels, when they are increased, you know, let's say, you just ate a meal that is going to stimulate your beta cells of the pancreas to make insulin. Insulin is now high in your bloodstream. Um, the, so what is the effect of insulin on your cells? On the muscle is going to increase glucose uptake and utilization, so increase the burning of glucose. It will increase your glycogen synthesis, so glycogen, glycogenesis. It will increase your amino acid uptake and protein synthesis. In your adipocytes, it'll also increase its glucose uptake. It'll increase um, lipo lipogenesis, which is glyceride synthesis. In the liver, it'll decrease gluconeogenesis. You no longer need glucose, you just ate. Okay, but it will store the excess glucose as glycogen, so increases glycogenesis. And it'll also increase your triglyceride synthesis, which is lipogenesis without any ketone synthesis. So we basically make ketones if we're starving. Um, now you want to compare that to your decreased plasma insulin levels in the post-absorptive state, um, which again, which would be under the influence of glucagon. So your effect on your muscle tissue would be that it decreases your glucose uptake Hey, it is going to now you're going to start tapping into those glycogen storages. So you are going to gly, increase your glycogen meta, catabolism, break down protein, um, you know, utilize fatty acids and ketones as sources of energy. Adipocytes. Again, you're going to start breaking down these triglycerides, release of release of glycerol and fatty acid into the bloodstream, and then the liver is going to take that glycerol fatty acids and also the amino acids and use those to make glucose. So that process is, is again, gluconeogenesis. It can also start making ketones. So remember that ke we make ketones um, in the post-absorptive state, not in the absorptive state. Okay, so how is it that um, our muscles and adipose cells need insulin in order to utilize glucose okay so we keep on saying that you know increase insulin levels inc increases your glucose uptake in the muscle it increases the glucose uptake in your adipocytes why is it that glucose uptake and utilization in your muscle and in your adipocytes are dependent on the presence of insulin because <clears throat> in order for glucose to enter your cell it needs a transporter Okay, so in, it, tr it is transported into the cell through facilitated diffusion. If you remember what facilitated diffusion was, if not, I would recommend to go back and take a look at it. But it was basically a transport mechanism where we need a transporter. Okay, so that molecule is just too big to kind of get through um, the cell membrane. But it was passive, okay? We do not need energy. Okay, so it is a passive transporter that we need to get the glucose into the cell. The thing is that in skeletal muscle and in adipose tissue, these transporters are not always found on the cell membrane. Okay, they are actually usually hidden inside of the cell. So you can see here these green glucose transporters are hidden in these vesicles inside the cell. And the cell membrane is empty. There are no glucose transporters until insulin comes, okay, and insulin attaches to the receptor, and through that signal transduction pathway will lead to that vesicle um, kind of transporting towards the cell membrane and attaching those transporters on the surface. 
So now these transporters are exposed, that is going to allow the intake of glucose into the cell. When insulin detaches from the receptor, these um, transporters are going to be taken in to the cell through endocytosis, and you see that they have now disappeared from the surface of the cell. So in order for our skeletal muscles and our adipose tissue to use glucose, that is totally dependent on the presence of insulin. The brain, though, is a little bit different. Okay, so in the brain, the glucose transporter, GLUT tra stands for glucose transporter, does not depend on insulin. So our brain cells have these transporters on the surface all the time. It does not hide them. It keeps them out there because your brain cells is in constant need of glucose. So again, it's not insulin dependent. We can take, our brain is able to intake and utilize glucose in the absence of insulin. Okay, which is not the case, again, in your skeletal muscles or adipose tissue where uh, the um, uptake or that, you know, this glucose transporter is dependent on the presence of insulin. That transporter is known as GLUT4. <clears throat> so how, what is the, how, you know, what is that kind of relationship between glucose and insulin um, when blue, blood gl glucose levels increase, so after a meal, Again, you stimulate your beta cells to make insulin. Insulin is now increased in your bloodstream. It will go to your adipocytes and muscles, increase glucose uptake. While it will go to the liver and it will um, stop your glucose uptake. And that was going to, sorry, stop glucose output. Okay, so it stops the process of gluconeogenesis. It actually helps the liver store any extra glucose, so it stimulates glycogenesis, and that is going to restore your, pla your plasma glucose levels back down to normal. So what are the things that stimulate besides high plasma glucose levels? What could stimulate the beta cells to make insulin? Well, basically the fact that you ate. Okay, so whether your glucose levels increased or your amino acids increased or your incretins increased. So incretins are those um, entroendocrine hormones that we talked about in chapter 15. So for example, um, gastrin, and, um, CCK, GIP, all of those um, entroendocrine hormones, the presence of those in your body means that you, are, you, have, you just had something to eat. Okay, so that is going to stimulate the beta cells. The parasympathetic nervous system, which is your resting and digesting system, that is also stimulatory to these cells. Um, sympathetic and epinephrine, those are inhibitory. So your sympathetic system, when that takes over your body, that's not the time to start making insulin, not the time to digest food. Um, so that is the, um, an inhibitory to these beta cells. Now, how does the body control glucagon secretion? Well, that is in your, in your post-absorptive state. When your plasma glucose levels go down, that is what stimulates the alpha cells um, to make glucagon. Now that glucagon is in your bloodstream, it reaches the liver, it increases glycogenolysis, increases gluconeogenesis, and increases ketones. All of those, kind of the breakdown, um, or the making of new glucose so that you can restore that plasma glucose levels up high and increase your plasma ketones again other bodies other you know cells can use that as energy source what is the effect so we talked we really talked a lot about hormones so what is the effect of the nervous system um the sympathetic nervous system when it comes to hypoglycemia so when our body, when our plasma glucose level goes down, that is going to stimulate, that is considered as a stressful situation to the body. So that stimulates the adrenal medulla to make epinephrine. Um, it also stimulates, um, you know, the sympathetic nervous system through nerves, um, you know, directly, those nerves that are directly innervating the liver and adipose tissue. And you, 
all three of these, you know, sorry, all two of these, the plasma epinephrine coming out of the adrenal medulla and the sympathetic um, nerve stimulation, that leads to the increase of the glycogen breakdown in the skeletal muscles and in the liver, plus also it increases gluconeogenesis in the liver, and it increases the lipolysis in the, liver, in the um, adipose tissue. All of that will lead to increased plasma glucose, fatty acids, and glycerol. We would also want to know the effects of different hormones um, on organic metabolism. So we're going to be talking about cortisol and I believe growth hormone as well. Um, so a little hint to remember the effect of cortisol on organic metabolism is that keep in mind that cortisol is a catabolic hormone, okay, and it's going to lead to hyperglycemia. So remember when we talked about stress, we said that chronic stress leads to high levels of cortisol that can lead to uh, patients or to individuals becoming diabetic. So that kind of summarizes the whole effect of cortisol. It is catabolic. It is going to break down different tissue, break down protein, break down fat cells. And then you're going to use, the body's going to use all of those to make glucose. So it will eventually lead to hyperglycemia. On the long run, it can lead to um, diabetes. So what it does... Okay, so due to chronic stress, for example, with high plasma concentrations of glucose, it increases protein catabolism, it increases triglyceride breakdown, it increases your lipolysis, and it's going to increase your um, making of glucose, so gluconeogenesis. And it, so you have all of that glucose available in your bloodstream, but it is going to prevent glucose uptake by the muscle cells and by the adipose tissue. So although there is a lot of glucose available, your cells are unable to take it. Okay, so your net result is high levels of amino acids, high levels of glucose, and free fatty acids. So again, remember that high levels of cortisol due to chronic stress can lead to diabetes. These free fatty acids can eventually lead to um, hypertension and stroke and so on. Now for the effect of growth hormone, and we're going to talk about the effect of growth hormone on carbs and lipids um, without the protein part, okay? Um, the effect of, on carbs and lipids are very similar to the effect of cortisol, and in the, in the, in the way that it increases lipolysis, and it also increases gluconeogenesis, and not only does it you know, kind of prevent the cells from using glucose, it actually uh, decreases the ability of insulin to stimulate glucose uptake by the cells. So remember we talked about our glucose, um, how insulin, in, you know, makes these transporters available. Well, growth hormone prevents that from happening, okay? So it reduces the ability of insulin to stimulate the glucose uptake by the muscles and by the adipose tissue. And since it opposes the effect of insulin, it is known as an anti-insulin hormone. Now for hypoglycemia, the definition is the uh, abnormally high, low, sorry, low plasma glucose levels. Um, symptoms can be very mild, like dizziness, headaches, and anxiety, um, and then, you know, could start to kind of evolve into tachycardia, trembling, confusion, loss of consciousness, con convulsions, and even coma. Okay, so what would, what are the causes of hypoglycemia? Fasting hypoglycemia can occur, let's say, in diabetic patients, where it uh, usually happens in juvenile onset diabetes, which would be the insulin dependent kind of diabetes, where the individual took or the patient took their insulin, um, but did but they skipped the meal. Okay, so the insulin is there, um, increases glucose uptake by the cells, but there is no meal intake to um, to maintain your blood glucose levels, and that can lead to dangerous um, hypoglycemia. Um, or the patient has an insulin-producing tumor. Okay, so these are known as insulinomas, where there is a pancreatic tumor um, where the cells are making lots of insulin. Okay. 
um, or it could be there is a defect in um, the metabolic pathways of glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis, especially if the patient has a liver disease or cortisol deficiency. Now this graph kind of shows you the interaction between um, glucagon and insulin levels and the concentration of glucose or the change in the concentration of glucose when a person is go undergoing moderate exercise. So you can see here that this individual is exercising for about 240 minutes and you wanna take a look at the glucose, the changes in the levels of these different things. So you'll see that when the person started to exercise, this is their glucose levels and it remains constant for about an hour and then it starts to gradually decrease. But the decrease is not um, dramatic, okay? The, the individual is still able to exercise for that amount of time. If you look at the insulin levels, for, in, for example, insulin levels are going down by exercise, okay? While the glucagon levels, remember we're going into this um, post-absorptive state, so the insulin levels are going down while the glucagon levels are going up. Okay, plus um, exercise also inhibits insulin and increases glucagon. But we said that insulin is needed in order to, is needed by the skeletal muscles to be able to intake and utilize glucose. Remember, their glucose transporters are insulin dependent. So how is it that athletes are able to exercise for long periods of time, which basically means their skeletal muscles is definitely using glucose and burning it, although their insulin levels are going down? The mechanism is actually unknown. We don't understand that yet, um, but we do know that um, you know, the effect of exercise and what it does to these hormones, but we really don't have that explanation as of yet. So know that the effect of exercise, you know, obviously due to the effect of there is the, you have increased sympathetic nervous stimulation. So there is an increase of epinephrine. Um, there is an increase of glucagon levels versus the decrease of insulin levels. Um, but the dilemma is, or, you know, the question mark is how is the body um, maintaining that constant glucose level and how are the, the cells um, maintaining that in uptake and utilization of glucose, skeletal muscles. So we'll talk a little bit, um, so again, you know, we don't know that, so we're going to kind of move on now to something that we do know, and that is um, our, the general principles of energy expenditure. So where, what, you know, kind of caloric intake versus caloric output and how do we get that energy? Well, we obviously take from the energy from the catabolic processes that happen in the body. Breaking down any of those chemical bonds, we're going to use that energy and utilize it to perform different things. About 60% of the energy that comes out of catabolic reactions is used to heat up the body. Okay, so we'll use that as internal heat. So we are known as endotherms because we have the ability to make our own produce our own heat. We do not depend on the heat of the sun to warm us up. Okay, that's what an endotherm is. Um, so um, the energy that we make, okay, that energy that we produce, we use it to heat ourselves up and to use the extra energy for work. If we do not use that energy for work, we are going to store it, okay? So that energy stored means that we are going to store it in the form of triglycerides, um, glycogen first, and then triglycerides. And obviously this is all affected by our metabolic rate. So there is a BMR, which is your basal metabolic rate, which is basically how much um, calories we burn Per time unit and there are different factors that tie in in order to um, that kind of um, affect our BMR okay the more active we are the higher your met metabolism is and you'll find that sleep has the lowest BMR throughout the day okay um, age 
also changes. So, you know, kids have a very high BMR. Um, young adults do have a, you know, a less, a lower BMR than kids. But as we age, that BMR tends to decrease. Your metabolic rates decrease um, with the increase of age. Gender, generally speaking, men have higher BMR rates than women. Um, during fasting periods, BMR tends to decrease, and that is order in order for the body to conserve energy. Um, and I just want to kind of go back to these, to the age and gender part. This is more of a generalized um, idea, but there are obviously variations, okay? So you could have like um, a 20-year-old that does not exercise, that would have a very low metabolic rate versus a 50-year-old that is very athletic, um, and they would have a higher metabolic rate, okay? So I'm just kind of, um, you know, if you take all of these out of consideration, generally speaking, age, um, BMR decreases with age, and general gender, again, it obviously doesn't apply to everybody, but generally speaking, uh, males have a higher BMR than uh, females. Now, the increase of these will increase our BMR, okay? So uh, if we're growing, okay, that increases our basal metabolic rate where we are now producing more energy increases our metabolism and that is known as thermogenic that's why kids have a very high um, BMR pregnancy increases metabolism as well menstruation and lactation infections and fever okay so um, you know with all of the activity of the immune system trying to fight off our metabolism tends to increase muscular activity obviously increases our metabolism and that is known as exercise-associated thermogenesis. Emotional stress can increase our metabolism. Um, environmental temperature, so if you're in warmer climates, you have a higher BMR than those living in colder climates. And then certain hormones like epinephrine and thyroxine and leptin. Um, we, have not, we didn't explain what leptin is, but I will in a couple of slides. And this, this um, table kind of shows you different um, activities that we go through and how much cal kilocalories per hour do we burn. You don't have to know these numbers. I just thought it's interesting to kind of share this. So sitting at rest. So as you're sitting here listening to me, um, okay, we're only burning 100 kilocalories an hour. You want to maybe compare that with walking, okay, okay. Um, that would be burning 360 kilocalories per hour. Rowing would be even more, 830 kilocalories per hour. So, you know, again, don't worry about the numbers, but um, again, I just thought it was interesting to kind of take a look at these and see if you're doing any of these, what is the caloric output um, for these different activities. So how do we regulate our total body energy stores? Okay. We obviously are going to intake energy in the form of chemical energy, which is food, and we are going to break that down, digest it, and then use those to burn and make um, energy. Okay, that whole process of making that energy, that would be our metabolism. Okay, energy from our food intake would be equal to the amount of heat that we produced and then the amount of work that we did, and then anything extra is going to be stored. So if you kind of rearrange these, okay, basic math, um, our, the amount of energy that we are going to store, which is the amount of triglycerides that are stored in our adipocytes, is going to equal how much did we eat, okay, so our caloric input, and you want to subtract from that how, much, how many calories did we use to produce heat plus the calories we use to um, to do our work. So like skeletal muscle activity and other cellular um, metabolism, other cellular activities. Now I would like to introduce you guys to these two hormones, um, ghrelin and leptin. Okay, ghrelin is also nicknamed the hunger hormone, okay? That's the hormone that uh, makes us 
um, growl, okay, so to speak, the stomach to growl, and that, you know, hence the name ghrelin. That's not why it's named that. It just helps us to remember what this um, ghrelin or hunger hormone does. Okay, so when we're hungry, the stomach releases this hormone, um, and it will stimulate your hypothalamus, the hunger center in the hypothalamus, and start to make you hungry. And not only that, it will also stop lipolysis, okay? It'll stop the process of breaking down fat to use that energy. It is a very um, stubborn hormone, okay? And it has been incriminated in weight loss failure. So people who are dieting, if you've ever tried a diet, you might know this, that, you know, sometimes you get to a part of the diet where you plateau, unable to lose any more weight um, or just total failure of the diet. And it's this hormone that has been identified as one of the causes of that. So that you're hungry again, um, you know, the lack of or the decrease of the amount of caloric intake stimulates the stomach to make ghrelin. And that is going to stimulate the hypothalamus so you feel very hungry. And at the same time, your body becomes that stubborn, um, those stubborn, adipocytes where there is no lipolysis lipolysis stops basically trying to push the body to eat um the another hormone that has also been kind of incriminated in that failure is known as leptin leptin though our name our um, hormone is made by adipose tissue okay and it's actually secreted by the adipose tissue in response to eating so if we, when we eat okay Adipose tissue makes leptin. Leptin circulates to the hypothalamus and it inhibits the hunger center. Okay, so when you're done eating, one of the reasons that we feel full is because of this leptin hormone. And it, um, it also increases our metabolism. The problem is that when we diet, okay, our adipose tissue stop making leptin. So now you are no longer inhibiting your hypothalamus. You're, you're no longer inhibiting. Um, you're actually now stimulating that hunger center. Okay, and you're also decreasing your metabolism, your metabolic rates. And so during dieting, again, um, you know, those changes in these hormones, you have the increase of grel ghrelin hormone and the lack of leptin hormone. Um, those, both of those, kind of stimulate your hunger centers and decrease your metabolism. And that is why exercise is always recommended in any diet program or any um, weight loss program um, in order to kind of combat or to balance the effect of leptin. So this right here is the poor hunger center in the hypothalamus and you see all of these different inputs and so what is it that stimulates or inhibits the hunger center? Well, you have, for example, how tasty is the food? Okay, so the tastier the food is, um, that is obviously going to stimulate your hunger centers. Stress and conditioned responses have different um, effects. So some people under stress, they, have, they show an increase in appetite, others lose appetite. The fact that you're eating, so the stretch of the, um, the, the stimulation of the stretch receptors in the stomach and the duodenum, which means that you're already eating, so now you can inhibit that hunger center. Having a fever, so high body temperature. When we're sick and we have a fever, again, we kind of lose our appetite as well. Remember we said that increased plasma ghrelin can stimulate it. Increased plasma leptin will inhibit it. The plasma GI hormones, um, which basically meant, again, that we are now eating, we no longer need to be hungry, those are inhibitory to the hunger centers, so are increased levels of insulin and glucagon. So now that we've learned a little bit about metabolism and metabolic rates, we want to learn a couple of definitions. So first off, the BMI, which is, stands for the body mass index, um, this is a construct where it is um, a ratio between the person's weight in kilograms over the square of the height of 
the person in meters. So we are not going to use pounds. We're not going to use inches. We have to convert those into these international units of kilograms and meters. Again, you put the person's weight in kilograms over the square of the height in meters, and that gives you the BMI. Okay, BMI of um, 25 or more, that is considered overweight, where there is an increase of the adiposity of the person leading to um, impairment of health. That could be either due to hypertension or heart disease or diabetes or sleep apnea. But a BMI over 30 is considered obesity. Um, so it, obesity denotes a large accumulation of fat. So when we have that BMI, we are thinking um, higher than 30. We're thinking in the, in the sense of adiposity. We're, we're kind of contributing that high BMI to high levels of adipose tissue. But I want you to kind of think for a moment, is it a true representation, though, of adiposity? In some individuals, it might not be. So in bodybuilder, muscle builder, building, um, for example, it could be that a person's weight has increased due to these hypertrophic muscles as opposed to the accumulation of fat. So that's something that we have to keep in mind, and we're using different things now to kind of, um, you know, dif differentiate between is it actually adiposity or are that high BMI due to other things. Um, a couple of eating disorders that we want to know about are anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. What they do have in common is that um, these individuals have are more um, obsessed with their body weight and they're also obsessed with their body image to others especially and this is unfortunately you've seen an increase in these um, diseases especially in the um, you know world of Instagram and you know that perfect picture that um, unfortunately it's more common in uh, young ladies so the but there are a couple of differences. So in anorexia nervosa, um, this patient is basically starving herself. And they it could be a fatal condition where they starve themselves to death. And they start to get into this post-absorptive state where they are now in this catabolic state and basically breaking down all of their tissue. Bulimia nervosa patients um, show a different, although they have... You know, the, um, the same reasoning behind it, which is this obsession with their body image, but they manifest it in a different way. So they sometimes indulge in this binge eating and then they induce vomiting. They could even use laxatives or diuretics to kind of lose, um, you know, quote unquote, any extra weight. They exercise vigorously to prevent any weight gain and to try to lose weight as much as possible. These are the recommendations um, on the caloric or the different dietary um, amounts to eat. This is not a nutrition class, so I'm going to have you guys kind of read through this um, for, you know, on your own time. That will take us to the differences in body temperature throughout the day, that circadian rhythm of body temperature. And that circadian rhythm, just like anything else in the body, there is a um, homeostasis around it where it is not a constant level, but it kind of fluctuates throughout the day. And you'll see here that we are, our bodies are the coldest, so to speak, during very early in the morning, so at around 4 a.m. And then that temperature te rises gradually due to the effect, obviously, of cortisol and epinephrine and kind of going through the day with our increased metabolism until it peaks around 4 to 8, and then it gradually decreases again, um, you know, throughout the night. This circadian rhythm, again, due to the difference, due to the uh, coincides, really, with the circadian rhythms of cortisol. So if you take a look at these two graphs, they kind of, they do correlate together. And as humans, we're endotherms, and I already explained that, we're also homeotherms. And homeotherms means that we have um, are able to go through these changes throughout the day, 
to go through um, thermal thermal homeostasis. Okay, we also have um, cyclic changes that happen in females. So after ovulation, body temperature in females goes up about half um, of a uh, centigrade. And that is normal physiology. Right, something that we really haven't talked about yet is the core temperature. So core temperature in this case means that we're measuring um, the temperature using a rectal thermometer, okay, not the temporal thermometer on the outside or oral thermometer. Core temperature means the temperature of the body on the inside. So how is it that we are able to have that homeostasis? Why are we considered um, homeotherms? The again, you know, just like most centers of the body, the center for temperature regulation is found in the hypothalamus. Okay, but we, and we do have receptors, um, central receptors in the hypothalamus as well, and that is going to re, um, record your core body temperature. We also have receptors out on the skin, and those are known as your peripheral thermal receptors that take um, that kind of record the temperature in the environment. Okay, all that hypothalamus is going to take all of that input and make certain changes to your body to make sure that your body temperature remains constant. It can do a couple of things. So it can either increase your thermal production, increase the production of heat by, for example, shivering, okay, sending these impulses to the skeletal muscles that it will, that is thermogenic. Or it could um, change the amount of loss of heat. Okay, so skin vasoconst vasoconstriction, for example, of your skin arterioles, that is a way that the body can um, stop the loss of heat or dilate the blood vessels in the skin, and that would increase body loss, uh, sorry, heat loss from the body. Sweat glands, that would be another way of, you know, increasing the activation of sweat glands and sweating that could increase the amount of body heat loss. Okay, so basically your hypothalamus is able to do this either by increasing your um, temperature or your um, increasing the amount of heat production, so through, through thermogenesis, or by decreasing the amount of heat loss. So how is it that an infection can cause a fever? If everything is under the control of the hypothalamus, um, we really have to reset that thermostat. We have to reset the hypothalamus. And it is actually reset by what are known as EPs or endogenous pyrogens. Endogenous pyrogens means that these pyrogens that are going to generate fire um, are made by us, by our own immune system cells. The macrophages are one of the cells that make them. They, are, they make interleukins and prostaglandins, especially interleukin-2 that will go to the hypothalamus and reset that thermostat. And that is how our body temperature goes up. Aspirin um, can stop the production of interleukins and prostaglandins, and so it'll block that process of, um, of resetting the thermostat. But we do consider fever to be a protective mechanism. Okay, Fever increases the activity of the immune cells, it also makes the body too hot for germs to live in. Okay, so the pathogens um, are able to survive in our normal body temperature. If you elevate the body temperature, that is a way of killing them. So what happens when we have a fever? Again, we increase your temperature set point. And in order to increase your body temperature, you start shivering, right? Okay, so one of the ways for thermogenesis, you're going to start shivering. Um, you can also start um, decrease your heat loss by curling up on clothes and you know and blankets. You can the um, there's also vasoconstriction of the blood vessels of the skin. So again, kind of going back to you are either increasing your heat production or decreasing your heat loss, and this is how um, your body temperature goes up. So what happens, what are the thermal changes that happen during exercise? Um, so right here is the period of not exercising while this is the body temperature during exercise. And you can see here that 
Although, when we start exercising, the heat production increases. Um, there is kind of like that sudden increase of heat production, but it is also accompanied by the increase of heat loss through sweating, through the vasodilation of the blood vessels of the skin. So at the end, your body temperature does not really spike. The core temperature goes up a little bit and then it plateaus. Um, and again, that homeostasis is maintained by excessive sweating um, and the vasodilation of blood vessels. But what happens if we're sweating, but we're not, um, we're not drinking fluids as we exercise? We can go into heat exhaustion. And that's where um, hypotension could happen. And again, it's due to that excessive sweating with no fluid intake and the excessive vasodilation of blood vessels. Okay, um, that can get worse okay and lead into a heat stroke and that would be a complete breakdown of of the thermoregulatory system in the body where you know the body temperature just skyrockets and can lead to convulsions and death okay that concludes chapter 16